which I don't think it's one a second, I think it's probably about 100 or 500 a second, but it's very chatty, REST MS. And REST is very chatty. It's get my message, delete my message, get my message, delete my message, one by one. Now, you can batch it. So I'm not really worried about if I have 100 a second. I can make it 10,000 per second by batching messages, which we do a lot, also in AMQP. So the trick is you make it simple, you make it work, you find out where it's too slow, you make it better. You don't start by making it fantastic. Start making it simple and making it work. And then when people say, look, it's too slow for me, make it better. AMQP is somewhere here. It can do something like 100,000 to about 500,000 a second, depending on the implementation, which is more than anyone needs in, outside of certain large companies. You mean like choreography? Uh, yeah, and things like, um, what's that often? Tipco product that stores, used in enterprises, or does queuing and message distribution, but also stores the data so you can request either down, stop. Sure. I would say not my problem. The thing is that we work in layers. And this layer is about shoving blobs of data around the network between peers. We're doing addressing, we're doing queuing, we're doing simple APIs, we're doing simple patterns for reliability, that's it. On top of that, you can build all kinds of services, including... And right. that. Do you know of anyone else who's augmented the work you've done right. by writing extensions that use the protocol to add those features? No. Um, what I was going to say was, it'll come. So, when you have layers that work and that are trusted, people will build on that. Companies like Tipco need to always raise the bar because they're selling stuff. Open source, we don't care. We can stay quite happily at one level and make it better and better. But it'll happen. Um, people using Tipco will say, well, why am I paying you know, 10,000 per core per year for this when I can make it myself on top of OpenAMQ? Okay, go, make it. At the back, a question. No, at the front. No. And there are many, many messaging products. Many. Thousands. But, and there are many open source products. The trick is, what are you actually buying? And this is the, this is the thing. It is... No. We have product. We have API. We have protocol. And again, you compare it to SQL, you can be buying Oracle, you're buying a product. Well, if you're comparing Oracle to Sybase to Informix, you're not winning anything. You're just choosing which lock-in you, you know, you're going to get. Now, open source, it's better, but it's still a product, you're still locked in. Okay, you have APIs. APIs are better, but APIs don't actually guarantee you very much, because APIs are always extended, modified, and changed. ODBC, again, a good example. Now, so, you want a standard. SQL 92, this is the way a select statement works. If you stick to that, it's going to be portable. And now you're suddenly you're free. And now you can take Oracle, put in MySQL, and if you stuck to that SQL statement, it'll work. So actually, when you're, when you're buying technology solutions, if you're buying products, you're just choosing a way to be locked in, unfortunately. APIs is better, but it's still not enough. This is the problem in Java, is Java is all APIs. You have JMS messaging. It's an API, and every single provider is different, and they all extend different ways. So you're just choosing a different kind of lock-in. So it's about standards. Standards are very important. And also DDS. DDS. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a protocol. It's uh, patented, and it's uh, not well documented, and yeah, okay, what can I say? I'm not a fan of DDS. Not a fan of patents, indeed. How long do we have still? We still have about 30 minutes. So, anyone that wants to ask more questions, please? Did anyone get Wi Fi working in the meantime? <laughs> no, I mean, did you get Wi Fi working? No? Oh, sorry. Okay. What happens if the broker fails? Do you have some kind of. Then you're in trouble. No, I'm just joking. Brokers fail. 
Um, there are different answers to that question. The, the one I like best is the broker shouldn't fail. And in fact, we put our effort into making a broker that doesn't fail, which is more fun than making a solution for when a broker does fail. So it's like, you know, I have a car. What happens if my car breaks? Well, what we do is we'll sell you two cars. And then we'll drive behind you with the second car all the time. The first car breaks, you jump in the second car, you carry on. It's fantastic. This is what they do. I'm serious. Okay, this is called, it's called a backup broker. And you actually have two brokers running and two big machines. And the one is going, the one's going, and this one dies. So then you switch off the backup broker and then you hope it all works. Nah, useless. This is what enterprise likes, but it's useless. It's, it's really a bad way of, of making reliability. Yes, machine could break down. Um, so backup machine, possibly a good idea. Possibly two machines if you're worried about your machines. But today machines don't break down anymore. Again, machines are very reliable. They have fail-safe power supplies, they have fail-safe disks. Okay, your data center could burn down. Okay, your building could explode. Sure, it could. It's really a matter of how paranoid you are. What we discovered in the end was that you can actually make the software completely and utterly reliable within the parameters of your application. Now, you can always crash it doing different things. Yeah, we have stuff that runs day and night in company A, and some other guy says, look, I do this and it dies. I'm like, wow, okay, that's something new he does. So software is never reliable without limit, but within the limit of a particular environment, it can be 100% reliable. At that point, it never crashes. And then, after six months or a year, the customer says, wow, it never crashes. And if it does crash, it restarts really quickly. And if you take an example like Dow Jones, they don't mind if it crashes, in fact, as long as they get the data back within one minute, as long as they get no duplicates. They don't mind if they lose data, in fact. But they hate getting data twice. You imagine that the stock price of Microsoft is going up and suddenly goes back up. You know, they would be crazy. So a gap is fine. Data later in the wrong order or double is, is really bad. So companies have also different requirements. Um, there are different answers to that question, basically. And my answer is make it really reliable and, you know, Try not to make it crash. Try to stop it crashing. Uh, do you use a particular product for the model, uh, for the code generation, or uh, is it something that's more important? Yeah, unfortunately, we've been doing this for something like 15 years now, code generations. We have our own tools for that. We have code generators. We have one called GSL. I mean, it gets really, really complex. I don't want to talk about it too much because it's, this is not simple. But it's a code generator. We have frameworks built around something called XNF, which is, a, a, again, a modeling, a modeling tool. And if you look at imatics.com, you'll find some reference to this. Code generation is, unfortunately, very, it's very leveraged, so it gets very abstract very quickly. Um, and that's, that's a bit of a shame. It means that people don't understand what we do. Uh, in fact, when we write... When we write software, we, we, we invent new languages, meta-languages, modeling languages, which describe protocols, describe state machines, describe classes. Then we generate from that, and we generate the generators. It lets us work very quickly, but it also means if you look at the code, you'll be like, what the fuck? This is impossibly complicated code. The, the generator code is really, really complex, the, and the meta-code is very abstract. So it's a bit of a difficulty for, for participation. It does let us write very good software very quickly. Yeah. It's open source, yes. Oh, all open source. It's all, all the metacode is GPL, and all the generated code is, I think, BSD. No. Okay, hands up who hears for the next speech and not my speech, just to see. Well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank thanks, you. guys. Thank you, Matthew.